Good morning, Grace and friends. Today's sermon is dedicated to Leanda and our music ministry. The title, What is the Worship God Loves? I have preached more than once on the worship God hates based on the prophet's challenge and to the Hebrew people who love to go to worship but who turned away from God's instruction on how to live especially concerning justice and compassion and caring for the most vulnerable in the nation. But today, let's think about the worship God loves. The Jewish scholar Arthur Green, in his book, Judaism for the World, writes, The pleasure God takes in human worship needs to be understood in terms of the human goodness and love brought forth in the worshiper and in the religious community. This is the biblical vision of worship. God doesn't need our worship for God's own sake as if God were the narcissist in chief. We worship for our sakes and for the sake of the world. I've loved Frederick, Frederick Bigner's uh, paragraph on worship. Uh, he says phrases like worship service and service of worship are redundant. So here are his words. To worship God means to serve him. Basically, there are two ways to do it. One way is to do things for him that he needs to have done. Run errands for him, carry messages for him, fight on his side, feed his lambs, and so on. The other way is to do things for him that you need to do. Sing songs for him, create beautiful things for him, give up things for him, tell him what's on your mind and in your heart. In general, rejoice in him and make a fool of yourself for him the way lovers have always made fools of themselves for the one they love. The Hebrew prophets were saying that true worship combines the love of God and the love of neighbor. Otherwise, it's just so much patting yourself on the back for being religious. Worship is bringing your whole self to God, all of who you are, for God's healing and comforting guidance. A couple of Sundays ago, our choir sang a beautiful anthem, God of the Sparrow. There's a new hymn I love called God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale. It sings the key questions of worship. God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale, God of the Swirling Stars. How does the creature say all? How does the creature say praise? God of the earthquake, God of the storm, God of the trumpet blast. How does the creature cry woe? How does the creature cry save? God of the rainbow, God of the cross, God of the empty grave. How does the creature say grace. How does the creature say thanks? God of the hungry, God of the sick, God of the prodigal. How does the creature say care? How does the creature say life? God of the neighbor, God of the foe, God of the pruning hook. How does the creature say love? How does the creature say peace? God of the ages, God near at hand, God of the loving heart, how do your children say joy? How do your children say home? We bring ourselves and all we cry to God, all praise, woe, save, grace, thanks, care, life, love, peace, joy, and home. 
So now we turn to the special, on the special day, the holy calling of music and worship. At its heart, the role of music and worship is to help us bring all of who we are to God, our praise and thanksgiving, our joy and delight, our sorrows and fears, our confessions, our need and the needs of the world, our courage and commitment, and the deepest offering of the self. Words aren't enough. We need the sacred gift of music. Paul wrote, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. The Spirit uses music to help us worship, to express the things too deep for words. Soren Kierkegaard's model for worship redepicts our normal way of thinking about worship. Often, he says, people go to worship like theater goers go to a play. The actors are the ones on stage, the people attending are the audience, and there are the prompters just off stage helping the actors say their right lines. But that is all wrong, he said. In true worship, God is the audience. The worshipers are the actors on stage, and the worship leaders, those who pray and preach and sing in the choir, and um, the choir director, the pianist, these are the prompters helping the worshipers say their right lines to God. That is, the lines each of us needs to say to God. That's the holy calling of worship leaders and preachers and prayers, the, the singers in the choir, the choral director, the instrumentalists. We're the prompters helping the congregation bring all they most need to God. And music is so important in this role. Instrumental music, for example, whether the prelude or offertory or postlude, helps us with its beautiful voice bring our whole selves to God. The prelude helps us make that transition from the everyday world into the sacred world and sacred time of worship. It helps open the door, it ushers us into worship. The offertory leads us more deeply into worship and helps us ponder what we need to offer to God. The postlude is a sending forth into the world with God's love. In the Chronicles of Narnia, when the children reach Narnia, one of them runs ahead shouting, further in and higher up. That's the role of the worship leader. And the choral music, the choral music. That, what would we do without a wonderful choir? Today and across our 50 plus years, the choir helps us bring our whole self to God by that holy alchemy of words and music brought together to move us further in and higher up, to help the mind descend into the heart, to illumine the words of Scripture. St. Augustine once said, to sing is to pray twice, once with the mind, a second time with the heart, once in the music, once in the words, then in the, in the note, in the music, those places, in music that's, uh, that touches those places too deep for words. Uh, I was blessed beyond words to um, have been the son of a minister of music. I sang in choirs from the youngest children's choirs, to, choirs of all ages, to the youth choir. 
I learned to love the poetry and the anthems and songs. I let scripture sink in at a deeper level as I sang scripture. There were some pieces of music in which I learned and sang all four parts as my voice changed from soprano to alto to tenor to bass. But there was something else that happened in church as I sang. Church music saved me from the literalism of Southern Baptist religion. I discovered that the words, all of them, pointed to something beyond, deeper, higher. I didn't get stuck on the literal meaning of the words. Sometimes God was a poet, a singer. Our thoughts, our words about God were, to use the Buddhist image, a finger pointing to the moon, not the moon. Through, through my years, I've worshipped in all kinds of churches, with worship high and low, as some describe it, worship formal and informal, with music from Bach to the Beatles, with prayers carefully written and extemporaneous, some using ancient prayers, others like Chris the other Sunday with the lyrics of Jimmy Buffett. I've worshipped with music ancient and new, praise and worship music, black spirituals and songs, the chanting of psalms in the monastery, instrumental music for the times there were just no words, and I have loved them all. The forms of worship and its music do not matter. What matters is if they help us bring our authentic, real self to worship and offer it to God. What matters is if the form of worship increases the love of God and neighbor. I think that's what's going on in the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well in John's Gospel. She was a Samaritan who worshipped in Samaritan ways. Jesus was a Jew who worshipped in his Jewish ways. Her worship was centered on Mount Gerizim, his in the temple in Jerusalem. There were worship wars then as today when people would go to war defending their way of worship and putting down others in their, in their ways of worship. Our arguments over worship then and now are our attempts to be separate and superior to others and to other churches. But listen to the conversation between Jesus and the woman. The woman says to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you say that Jerusalem is where people ought to worship. Jesus answered, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Abba in spirit and in truth. God is spirit and those who worship, worship in spirit and truth. What might this mean, this in spirit and in truth? In truth means I think that we speak the best truth we can know about ourselves and our world and God. We seek truth as a form of worship itself. We seek to love God with, yes, all our minds. We tell the truth in worship. In spirit means we can worship God anywhere and everywhere. Whenever and wherever God's Spirit and our Spirit dwell together, there is worship. God is not a tribal deity with one holy place. Everything is holy. Anywhere can be holy. In a church sanctuary, beneath the stars, on the top of a mountain, or by a stream, or in a private solitary place at home or in the garden. Some people love to dictate 
for others the one true place or style of worship. Jesus had other ideas. He knew well about religious feuds and worship wars. Paul agreed and made a special place for music and worship. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, he wrote. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Andre de Buse was a wonderful short fiction writer. In one of his stories, there was a stable owner named Luke Ripley. Every morning, he awoke at 4.45 for an hour of contemplation and conversation with God. Then he had breakfast, went to the stable to feed the horses, then he rode his horse down to the small Catholic church down the road to have morning mass with Father Paul and five or six regulars. This daily routine taught him, in his words, the necessity and wonder of ritual. Or as I would phrase it for today, the necessity and wonder of worship and its music. This is how he described it. For ritual allows those who cannot will themselves out of the secular to perform the spiritual as dancing allows the tongue-tied man a ceremony of love. Our hearts are so fickle, our tongues are so tied, but worship allows us tongue-tied folk our ceremony of love. Sometimes we're going along in worship on automatic pilot, but here comes a song, a tune, an anthem, a hymn, and then there comes a, a tear, a lump in the throat, a surge of hope, a, an indwelling peace, a new resolve. Thanks be to God for the gift of music in worship. Amen.